travel and things in association with rugged wear real people real clothing real solutions presents in conversation with i am your host david batsoffen and today my guest is legendary photographer and co-author of safari secrets the big five that's gerald hein gerald good morning welcome to you good morning david thank you for the interview it's it's only a pleasure. It was so great to actually meet you in person. I, I love the fact that because often now, you know, COVID seems to have changed an awful lot, the way we meet, the way we interact with people. Um, so to get to actually meet you and Will um, the other day at the book at a, at a proper book launch was was very exciting for me. It really, it really was. Thank you, David. It was good to meet you as well. Before I get into, into the book, uh, which is, as we said, Safari Secret, Secrets. What is a secret? <laughs> I sound like, what is that guy from the cartoons? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know who I'm thinking? Elmer Fudd. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, secret. Yeah. Yeah, Safari <laughs> Secrets. The Big Five is published by HPH, um, which is a really good uh, publishing house when it comes to, to natural um, history uh, books. I have to ask you, those cabinets behind you, do they contain thousands of images or are they just there for show? No, those cabinets are oh, from the old days when we used to take slight images. <laughs> <laughs> There's thousands, thousands of images in there, um, but uh, we use them occasionally. Right. But of course, um, with, with a higher quality in uh, the, the modern cameras, yeah. we don't use them. You don't use well, them too often. We only use them when really necessary. This is okay. my very first film camera that I got okay. when I was 21, and, and it still works. Wonderful. Wonderful. Look, they, they were good old cameras, but um, I think the, the, the new Not cameras handle, handle ISO much better. Um, they give a better quality. There's, uh, there's far more uh, pixels to work with in, in the raw image. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this the the advantage of, of the modern camera is certainly huge. So what are, what is Safari Secrets all about? Okay, Safari Secrets came up um, as an idea. We were sitting chatting, trying to work out a book. We'd already uh, decided to do this type of book, mm -hmm. but we hadn't had a, 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 we hadn't sort of name out for the book. Anyway, William came up with the idea of Safari Secrets. And the moment he mentioned that, it just struck us. And then we started to put the concept of the book together. Um, because originally it wasn't going to be as detailed about photography and tracking as it is now. Um, but we decided to do the boxes um, to where William's got the uh, green boxes and I've got the yellow boxes throughout the book whereby we give little hints and tips about so, tracking. That's what you're referring to. Says exactly. Fine. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's one of my tips on color and contrast. Um, so throughout the book, we give these tips. And well, well the, the text is designed into, set out in the big five. Yeah. And then it gives everything William wrote the text on, on the big five. And that's mainly about tracking. Um, and then the back of the book, we've done the little five and the ugly five and um, all the rest of it, five other cats. But, just, but just five. The, the one thing that, that you have, you, you do the shy five. We do the shy five. Okay, yes. so you've included aardvark and porcupine into that, but where does the pangolin fit in? Um, I don't know. Um, we did our research mm -hmm. and this is where, where what everybody calls the shy five. So we went along with our research. We made okay. it up ourselves. <laughs> Fair enough. Because for the longest time, as I told you when we met, um, I didn't believe that pangolin existed. I thought they were yeah. just a figment of somebody's imagination and they'd cobbled together until after yes. 53 years, I found my first one in the bush. And then it becomes still, a whole different I, experience. I still think they, uh, they, they're not out there. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen one yet out in, in the bush, it's wild. <laughs> As I said, I'll, I'll send you one of my pictures. You can put it in your next book and pretend yes. it's yours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> of, of the big five, which is your favorite to shoot? 
And we're talking photographically now, but less people yeah. know, is Gerald going out and killing things? Yeah. David, you know, that's an interesting question. I think my favorites are, are obviously leopard um, and lions, uh, probably because, and elephants, of course, mm. are also easier, easier to photograph than buffalo and rhino. Um, buffalo and rhino are difficult to, to, to photograph to, because they don't often do things. Elephants are a little bit easier than, than, than buffalo, um, and rhino may be a little bit easier than buffalo as well. Mm. So, yeah, I, probably my favorite, let's say, is between lion and leopard. Because you, when, when we, again, when we met, I'd asked you what your favorite image in the book was. Yes. And, <laughs> you know, you tend, you tend to focus on the poor fellow's tongue, and then you realize that this guy has got no horns left, He's at the tail end of his life, although I wouldn't like to be the one that told him that. <laughs> yes, no. Um, yeah, they, they, they probably have quite a while to, to live still because yeah. uh, the, the, their longevity is, is, is fairly good. But yeah, he's, he's certainly been through the wars that time. <laughs> <laughs> and as you say, the, the, the interesting one for me when it comes to, to Rhino is black rhino because they will hide behind a twig and they will stand there for the no matter how long you think you can last you yes. they are going to outlast you when it comes to yes. hiding away white rhino want you to take their picture yes white rhino are very much more placid um we actually spent six weeks in the pilonsburg filming for um, our movie the big five mm. um, and we spent six weeks just tracking and working on black rhino. And it was probably the most terrifying six weeks of my life. <laughs> we spent more time behind rocks and up trees. And, uh, <laughs> we were talking about a little branch or something like that, or twig or mm -hmm. out of a tree. Um, it actually stops a black rhino's charge. My son was behind the camera with, uh, with, on, on a tripod. And he took a full-on charge from a black rhino. Wow. And just having the tripod and the camera in front of him actually stopped the charge. Hmm. And see, George, the guy we were using as, as the rhino, as the main character of, of the film, um, told us that if we can stand behind a very, very thin, narrow tree, it will stop the charge. So, <laughs> yeah. Gerald, yeah. you know, I love these sort of, these sort of people. They know it. You now know it, but my question is, does the rhino know this? Because he or exactly. she is the most important part of this equation. And if they go, exactly. why is that human holding up a twig and think it's going to stop me? I'm going to run right <laughs> over there. But having, yeah, exactly. having but said he, that, he, you mentioned the Pillensburg. I think Pillensburg is a very underrated Big Five reserve. Um, yes. If you take out the fact that the roads are in really bad condition and some of the yes. humans that frequent there have no idea how to get in and out of sightings, but yes. they they are pulling in stunning leopard pictures, leopard sightings yes. there. Um, yes. Ellie's rhinos, both black and white. And yeah. I've sat, sat at the Monkwe Hide and seen black rhino drinking not too far from me. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I think the Pilonsburg has uh, really grown up. And as you say, if they just fix the roads a bit, it would be a pleasure to go there. Okay, but um, now but now we're going off the beaten the track. So... <laughs> Sorry, David. No, no, no. I spoke over you. It, now we're going off the beaten track. So let's get back to the book because that's okay. what this chat is all about. So okay. we, so you, you focused in on the big five. In fact, let's talk about the image on, on the cover because this... You know, a lot of people would would go past this image or wouldn't think to take pictures in light like this. But you say, use every opportunity. I mean, you not everybody lives in the bush and is capable of taking images like this on a daily basis. So why not snap the pic? And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, well, you'll try another one. Yeah, I think that's a lot of uh, the attitude of quite a few photographers. Um, just that's... Um, are you still there, David? Yes, I am. Yes, I'm here. Um, I seem to. Have no, lost. I can see you. Just keep talking, Gerald. Don't okay. worry. Yeah. Um, I think that's a problem. A lot of people 
seem to go into into the bush and just snap, snap, snap away, mm-hmm. and then hope that they, they get the right image in amongst the thousands of images they take. <laughs> but um, it, you know, it's actually something where you've you've got to feel the image before yeah. you take it. Uh, you, You've got to really work it, and I prefer sort of um, low down images, mm-hmm. uh, it, which gives you full contact uh, with with the animal in the bush. It doesn't look so artificial as shooting from up above, yeah, directly off a vehicle. And you know, it's not always possible to like go lie on the ground because it could be a little bit dangerous. Um, but still, when animals on logs or termite heaps or on an on embankment or something like that, it's good to get eye level with, with mm. them. And also, um, in the vehicle, if there's not too much bush around, move off a little bit um, to, to break the angle. Yeah. Uh, and then you get that eye-to-eye contact as, as well. So... In saying that, I think people should actually concentrate more on taking one or two or three good images than just firing off and hoping to get a good shot in between. If, if you're sitting on a vehicle with one of those, um, I'm not going to mention brand names, but if you're sitting with one of those guys that can fire off sort of 15 frames a second, and it sounds yeah. like a machine gun in your ear, um, yeah. And then you wonder, out of all of those thousands and thousands of images, did they even get the image they were after? Yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, look, it's good to have a camera that shoots a lot of, uh, it's got a high frame rate. Mm-hmm. In fact, my one camera shoots 30 frames a second. Wow. But, you know, with that, um, when I first got the A1, I started off excited about all the frames but going home and editing all that stuff is a nightmare <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, so you know, now, that's where no. people don't realize that the the initial taking of the image is probably the easiest part of the whole thing but you you might well be like myself and other people other photographers who came up via film um yes in as much as you com- try and compose as much as you can in camera and in the moment so that you've got yeah. very little in inverted commas to do when you get home as far as manipulation. Yes. But you also find that you um, sort of, your your composition is a lot better when, when you do it that way. Yeah. Uh, if you just shoot off because you want an image, that's fine. If you want to take home a memory, but if you want to get images that you want to hang on your wall, mm. um, I think we've, you've got to think about it. And also coming from film, you know, we had 36 um, <laughs> on, on, a, on a spool. So we couldn't just shoot off and shoot off because <laughs> uh, we ran out of film. But today, of course, with, with the memory, memory sticks, you can do just as much as you like yeah. with the cards. Yeah. And of course, and of course, there's no cost. I mean, that was the the thing, you know. You, you go away on a holiday and come back, and DNP, the development and yeah. printing, cost you more than your holiday did. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> will people who buy this book? Well, now, let me rephrase that. Who is the book aimed at, Gerald? Is it aimed at amateur photo- wildlife photographers, or is it aimed at semi-pro and even pro photographers who are looking just to to up their game that little bit to take their images from good to great or from great to excellent? Good good question, David, because um, that was something that I had to ponder for, for quite a while before I started writing on the photography side. Um, if I aimed it too high, mm-hmm. um, then the chap that's just starting out wouldn't be able to uh, get anything from the book. Yeah. So I aimed it through the middle um for the average person and i've aimed it for the person that really really wants to um improve with their photography mm. and take something that they can show their friends and, and as i say that they can do fine art photography yeah there's a huge difference between fine art photography and just photography um and i know that fine art photography is comes from within yourself mm. and when you're happy with your photographs you probably got there but the trouble is we're never happy with our photographs. So we just have to keep on learning. Um, 
And when we've learned, we must keep on learning some more. Yeah. Um, there's, there's really a lot to learn about photography if you want if you want to get sort of great images, you know. Do do you have because I know it's happened to me where I've taken one that springs to mind was a wild dog um, in Pilansburg, interestingly enough. That mm -hmm. when I came home and I looked at the image, I went, if I never shoot another wild dog picture, I'm happy with this one. And that yeah. lasted all of a week. And then I went, no, hang on a second. We're going off to yeah. the Waterberg. There's a wild dog pack there. I'm going to try and better this. Yes. Well, that's exactly what I said. You know, once you once you're happy with your photography, don't stop there. Keep learning. <laughs> Because, so my um, question is, do you have an image like that that you thought was the, the seminal picture of a particular animal until you took the next seminal picture? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, I went uh, in the old days the act for photographer of the year. Mm. <laughs> and that picture is on my, on my book, Africa's Big Five. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a nice image, but... Um, Today, I wouldn't really be so excited about that yeah. because I've, I've got better. I've got better images than that now. You see, this is what happens. And this is why we take lots of images because at the end of the day, everyone, we think that the next one is better and the next one. And then you go back a year later, as like you said, ACFA photographer of the year, and you look at that and you go, yeah, it was a, a good picture in its time, but hey, maybe I should submit and say, take that one away and put this one in its place. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, my mom used to say to me, what are you going back to the bush for again? Are you sure you <laughs> must have photographed everything that they is? <laughs> they don't, non-photographers don't understand how, and I, I have to take my hat off to bird photographers, because those people have the patience of Job, and they will sit yeah. for hours and hours waiting for one miserable bird to move yes. its head in a particular direction, you know. One little day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and they get all excited about that. And we're, well, I suppose, the same. Would you spend, and I know that you and I have both spent uh, time in a particular hide at Medikwe at um, Bush House, and we, mm -hmm. I love that hide, and I know that you do too. Um, yes. And I can spend hours in there, you know, yes. literally. I'd, I'd sleep in there if Sue would let me. Yes, well, she would. She would let you know, I think. But um, yeah, I, I certainly that hide. I spend days in it. Um, yeah, it's certainly one of the best places in Africa to photograph elephants. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, they walk right next to you, as you know. You can almost touch them as they yeah. walk past. So, do they <laughs> know you there, and, and have they spoiled your equipment from from time to time by flicking mud through that thing? Well, they've more than spoiled my equipment. I was doing some um, remote photography from the hide, and I put my camera in some thorn bushes next to the water, and a little Ellie got sort of very, very curious about what this strange object was, um, and he just gave it a little shove with his trunk, and it mm -hmm. boom into the water, 100,000 rand into the <laughs> <laughs> how do you explain that to your insurance company when you put in the claim and you go and they go how did you lose it and you go yeah, elephant that, threw it into a water hole that taught me a lesson i've, I've never insured my equipment that that is insured now <laughs> <laughs> at, at the price of cameras today i think yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the once you no, let me rephrase this. When do you know that a book is complete? When do you and Will, in this particular instance, when did you say, okay, we can write the end, we can use the last photograph, we can send it off to HPH, let them do the layout and the publishing, and I'll walk away? Okay. We have a um, deadline, mm -hmm. and that is set by Heinrich at HPH Publishing. So we work on the book until that deadline. Um, and then sometimes uh, we don't meet the deadline. Sometimes we might take a two or three months. To meet. But that delays the book for, we, we try and get our books out, um, mm -hmm. reason three, four months before Christmas. Yeah. So that we can hit that market. Um, so if we miss our deadline, 
uh, which is normally three to four months before the book hits the market because they has to go overseas to be printed and then they have to, they have to come and they have to ship the books out to us. So there's a four month delay from the time we, we complete everything. And of course, they have to do layouts and they have to, uh, we have to have the thing edited and mm. it's, it's a heck of a job before the book actually is to be say, right, off it goes to the printers. I don't think people so, realize what, what work a book, doing a book like this is. I mean, it's the quality of the images, the writing, you've got to check every word because I saw that the book comes with a with an addendum because there were two mistakes that you'd picked yeah. up and, and now yeah. that's been inserted into the book. Um, yeah. So be, people need to realize this doesn't just happen overnight. Um, no, it, it actual fi final product is, uh, there's a heck of a lot of work in the final product. Yeah. Um, just as much work as there is in the actual doing the photography and the writing. Uh, are you sorry, Gerald? When when you look at the book now, yeah. uh, you and Will and I'll be chatting to to Will at um, a later point because he lives uh, in Cape Town and it was difficult to to get the three of us together um, on this Zoom call. Um, is there something that you now think if only we'd done this instead of that, or used this image instead of that image, or added or subtracted from, it would have made it better than it is now because it's a beautiful yeah. book it really and truly really is thank you david i appreciate that um yes david there is and and the, the reason being that the book comes out that you carry on working on the next project because yeah. we i like to always have a project to work on um, and we are working on a mala mala book at the moment uh um, you look at the book and then you carry on working and you get more images that, and then you say, wow, I wish I had these images before I produced this book. <laughs> Seeing because the book is... No, yeah, sorry. I, so that's exactly it. That's exactly what we've been saying is there's almost, there's always that one more image if only we'd had it four months ago. You know, we've got it now. So we'll use it in the next book. Yes. And, you know, photography is about opportunism as well. Yeah. Um, and, and being at the right place at the right time and unfortunately being in the right sort of area. I, I research areas that I know exactly what I'm going to do before yeah. I go on it. Um, and it pays for people to actually research the area before they, they go away. And they'll sort of know more or less what they expect from that area and go, go to the internet, have a look at photographs taken in those yeah. particular areas. It's quite easy today. You've, you've got you've Sorry. got a couple of images of a lion trying to take down a baby elephant in this book. Yep. Did it succeed? Yep. Because it, yes. it it did. Yes. What oh. what actually happened there was um, the lions were on on the open plains in in, in Botswana, right? On the plain, and um, this little Ellie came down on, on its own. Obviously, it had the been image. separated from the herd. And it came down to uh, to drink water, and a lioness actually left the kill that they were busy on, and came and um, took this elephant down and and killed it. Yeah. The, the only reason that I'm bringing this particular image up is because you mentioned um, opportunist uh, images and right place, right time. Yes, well, that happened because mm -hmm. that happened around about midday because um, you know I spend hours all, all the time in the bush and I was just sitting on the flat plain, plains and the, and the lions were far away on, on, a, on their own antelope kill um, but I just thought well I'm going to sit here and see if anything happens and of course it yeah, did. it happened. <laughs> there were no other cars around not a single car and wow. that in Chopin Reserve where, where there's actually lo a lot of traffic so um, yeah, I've placed this it around, and uh, you have to be patient to get the to get the right images. In now, you have. I was going to say, in summary, and thank you so much for taking time out of a really busy schedule to chat with me today. Um, you've got some pointers that um, I don't know if you know off by heart, or if you've got a book close at hand, but it's on page one hundred and thirty-eight. Um, looking at things like get to know your camera. 
Um, yes. A lot of people, I've been on, on safari with people who have bought a camera at an airport. You yes, know, on, exactly. on landing, and they have no idea what they're doing with it. And then they'll exactly. sit with me and go, can you help me with this? And I go, well, I don't know this camera. Um, just put it on, on A4 for automatic yes. and shoot on that. Yeah. I think a lot of people do that. Uh, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with it because the modern nothing. camera, um, the automatic and program uh, of work exceptionally well. Um, but if you want to be a little bit more creative, I really advise people to get to know their cameras. Yeah. And talking about that, um, when I'm in the bush, um, I seem to spend a heck of a lot of time with people asking me questions about <laughs> <Yeah>. their cameras. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, there are YouTube. Yes. <laughs> on, 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 on every single camera, there are YouTube that you don't have to sit and read something. You can actually get instruction off the internet. You can. And I really advise people to do that. It's uh, it, hel it helps a heck of a lot. If you know how to move your eyes so that you don't get a blurred image when an animal's running or the light has <laughs> got, got so dim that you need to push up your eyes so or increase the, the amount of light going mm. into the lens. Um, if people should know these things and, and it will help them get better images. The, the other one, I'm, I'm just working through your list, um, adjust settings before leaving camp. Specifically yes. if you shot at night, because yes. your first image the next morning is going to be overexposed unbelievably if you haven't yes. checked your settings. And it's always the one that you say, oh, darn. If only yeah. I had the settings correct, I would have got the best shot I've ever had type of thing. You know what happens when you go out early in the morning, David? You 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 normally come across something reasonably exciting because things happen early yes. in the morning. And then you fiddling to get your camera out of the case and oh it's oh all the settings are wrong because I was doing night photography last night. So I make a point of uh, sitting in the vehicle. I go to the vehicle about 20 minutes earlier than, than we due to leave. And I just set my cameras. Yeah, I'm with you on uh, that. So, and then I set them on the fastest speed and the, the highest high so that I like using. So that if something happens immediately, I just pick my camera up and take and snap it off, you know. Uh, Gerald, we're about, to, we're about to run out of time and, and I don't want to get cut off. I will, I will pick this up with Will when I, when I chat with him, some of the other pointers and the tips. The book right. is called uh, Safari Secrets, The Big Five. It's by Gerald and Will. And um, it is, it's available already? Yes. Yeah. Published, uh, published by HPH. Go into your bookstores or you can get it online. Gerald, thank you so very much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And you see, we've we've been having so much fun, we've run out of time here. It's unfortunate, thank but that's you, just David. what happens. <laughs> you Great take talking. care. And I, I look forward to care. spending time on a vehicle with you at some time in the not too distant future. I'd love that. I'd love that. Okay, David. Gerald okay, Hind, who's part, one of the one of the authors of Safari Secrets of the Big Five, and it's published by HPH.